It was a great privilege to be asked to do the introduction to this video. And it was my intention in my time-honoured tradition to present the video in a suit and tie. However, it's come to my notice that the suit and tie don't represent what they used to represent to the average Englishman. And indeed, some of this country's worst criminals, past and present, wore or wear suits. And this is not a legacy that I wish to be a part of. Hence, my coming before you now dressed in casual clothes. I'll be blunt, this video comprises two things, the problem and the solution. The problem is twofold. It is the United Nations Agenda 21, which, if it has its way, or when it has its way, will put human beings into human settlement zones, banning us from access to the countryside. Things which we take for granted, such as cars, consumerism, farming, paved roads, golf courses, and even the family unit itself, are all listed as unsustainable in the United Nations Agenda 21. Which sounds like a conspiracy theory, but I can assure you that in the first part of this video following the introduction you'll see the actual book itself published by the United Nations. The second part of the problem is the European Union. It's not widely known but the European Union was actually the brainchild of the Nazis in the early 1940s, produced as a backup plan in case they were unable to win the war militarily. Now this may sound really quite extreme, but I assure you, if you research it, you will find that this is the truth. Everything that we state in this video can be verified, either on the internet or even in a public library. The main bugbear to the proliferation of the European Union has been the British Constitution, and I can assure you, we most certainly do have a constitution in Britain. It's very old, it's very wise, and it protects us. It protects us from the criminal elements within our society, and from a despotic or out-of-control government. Hmm, does that sound familiar to you? Magna Carta 1215 restates the rights that we have, unalienable rights that we have in Britain. They can be neither taken nor given by any man, woman, or claimed authority. We are sovereign beings, and our constitution says so. Underpinning the constitution is our precious common law. It's been with us for over 1200 years. Again, it is wise. The laws and customs of the people. And the reason it is wise is that it's based on social justice. One cause no harm. In other words, don't murder or injure another person, or even bully them for that matter. 2. Cause no loss. Thou shalt not steal. 3. Be honest. In other words, commit no fraud against another. And 4. Be peaceful. Don't breach the peace. Those four tenets comprise our common law. It's common sense. And we're on the verge of losing it. If we become fully integrated with the European Union, we stand to lose a thousand years of tradition and common sense in favour of a system whereby you are treated as guilty until proven innocent. My friends, we cannot allow this to happen. The second part of the video comprises David Robinson an experienced man in the matters of Magna Carta, Article 61. It is the protection within our Constitution, sometimes called the Security Clause, and it gives us, the people, the power to hold to account a despotic government. And my friends, that is exactly where we are right now. We are soon, it would appear, to lose our right to free speech. We could end up being put in prison simply for criticising the government. 
our right to publicly protest appears to be on the cards to be withdrawn. What kind of state are we going to be living in? Well, Article 61 is the solution. It provides us the remedy in order to hold to account a despotic government. I appeal to you to watch this video, to learn from it, then go and verify everything that we are claiming. And once you have done that for yourself, please submit your oath and join us in the fight to recover our country from the selfish psychopaths who have taken control. We the people have the power to do this under Article 61 Magna Carta 1215. Hello, my name's Sandy, Sandy Adams. I'm, I'm a mother and uh, I, I run a small business. I want to talk about Agenda 21. I have been doing quite a lot of research into it in the last two years or so. And I just wanted really just uh, get the word out about uh, the implications of United Nations Agenda 21. I'm going to start off by really going through all the process of how Agenda 21 has actually got into our lives and into our local councils and where it came from, its origins and how it's, it's affecting us now and how it will affect us in the future. It started off really, I mean it, it's not a conspiracy theory, it's this. This is United Nations Agenda 21. You can buy it from Amazon, uh, you can read it. It's, um, it's a 42 a chapter document really and it was brought about in a Earth Summit in Rio in 1992 um, where 179 countries of the world, the world leaders of 179 countries got together in Rio, they were invited by the UN to uh, really to talk about global warming. Al Gore was there, the Bilderbergers were there and it Really, it was the, a lot of people from the Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, all the major movers and shakers of, of, of global geopolitics were there. And they managed to, using the, the fear mongering of global warm, warming, uh, got 179 countries to sign up to Agenda 21. The outcome of that was, was, was really that it's been implemented now and it's gone really from, their, their plan was to get it from global to national to local, which is why, why now Agenda 21 is in most local councils in, in Britain and uh, it is all over the world now and in America Agenda 21 is rolling out very very heavily and people's land is, is being taken away and it's, it's quite, you know, it, anyway I will get on and talk to you about it. Before this book was written, uh, was, this report was put together one of the, the, the biggest advocates of Agenda 21 was a chap called Maurice Strong, and in fact it was said to be his brainchild. He worked at the UN. He was also, he's a, a very odd mixture of politics. He's a Marxist, but also a huge capitalist. He was in, in big business in America with the Rockefellers. He worked for the Rockefeller administration for a long time, you know, with, with the Rockefeller family. He was disgraced in the all for food scandal in the 1980s with Korea, with um, a scandal which was... So he fled to, to communist China, but he was behind Agenda 21. And he and a, a lady called Gro Brundtland, who was the Prime Minister of Norway um, in the 1980s, they put their heads together. She was a... Um, a Marxist also, and she, they put their heads together and they, they decided they could cure the world's ills if, if only we could um, give up sovereignty of, of lands and, and, and pool all the resources of the world, you know, the money, basically, and distribute it. And her, they wrote a book together, or a report, and again it was a report, and it was called Our Common Future. And it was a report on the World Commission of Environment and Development. It was by Maurice Strong and Gro Harlem Brundtland. Um, and it was, the idea was that wealth needed to be distributed around the world, which is a very worthy, you know, idea. But behind it um, is, is this idea, really getting rid of national sovereignties. Um, and she, they, they put this into a book, 
and they since turned it into Agenda 21 and made it into the Earth Summit. Yeah, the affluent countries are destroying the planet, therefore a plan needs to be implemented. Uh, that, was, that was the idea of our common future, which then turned into Agenda 21. And from Agenda 21, uh, two years later, they produced this, which is the Global Biodiversity Assessment, which is a, um, a huge, over 1,000-page document, which inventorises everything on our planet, which is basically what Agenda 21 is all about. It's all about inventorising and controlling all land, all water, all minerals, all construction, all plants, animals, education, energy, means of production, information and human beings. And all this, all that is in this, in this book. And it's, it's saying that unless we do something about global warming, which is, a, according to this assessment, is something that's been... Um, that, it, that is anthropogenic, that we, as people, as, as inhabitants of this planet, we have created this problem, that we need to be controlled and inventorised. And this really is a, is, a, is a report to control humanity. What they advocate in this book is to, um, to, to remove man from nature. Man is the problem, and we have to re be removed from nature and to be brought into an, an urban environment, to be surveilled. Well, they don't say that, but it, what will happen and what, the, what, what I've been, my research has led to is that we will be taken into what they call human settlement zones. That's all in this book, that the, the people of the planet need to be put into urban environments in order to be controlled and to be carbon taxed and all of that. Now, Al Gore was, was the main person behind, or seemingly was the main person behind the whole global warming um, uh, sham that happened at Rio. And it's been brought to my attention that, in fact, he didn't even write Inconvenient Truth. Maurice Strong wrote it. And Maurice Strong now lives in, in communist China. That's where his politics lie. He actually lives there quite happily. He was never really brought to account for the author food scandal. And a lot of what Al Gore's um, research into what he believes is global warming has brought this about. And it's it really, it's just a, a scam in order to control humanity and to make us believe that we have destroyed the planet. Therefore, we have to be controlled. After, after the Global Biodiversity Assessment was written, various bodies were set up, and one of them is called ICLE. Now, ICLE is a, a, a global organisation, and it's the International Committee for Local and Environmental Initiatives. It's, um, it's, a, it's a council that's been set up to go literally from, nas from global, national to local. And ICLE is in most uh, town councils in England. ICLE is, um, it was set up to implement Agenda 21 right down from global to local. It works in a quite, quite an insidious way, really, ICLE. The council use ICLE in order to get their policies pushed through at local level. And what they do is they use a, 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 a system called the Delphi Technique um, so that if they want to push through a piece of legislation on a local level, they will uh, create a meeting, a public meeting, um, and at that meeting they will invite maybe 2% of the population of that particular town, and they will get a consensus on what they want pushed through. And they use this technique called the Delphi technique, which is um, really giving people the impression that they are affecting change, but actually leading them to a predetermined outcome. And, and it's a very clever NLP technique, and it's used a lot, and it's being used globally. It's, it's a bit like common purpose, if anybody knows what common purpose is. It's the same as that. It's the same kind of technique that's used on common, common purpose. So they actually bring all their ideas forward at these meetings, and they get local uh, initiatives pushed through, whether it's, it's, whether it's on farming, whether it's on whatever it might be, it's pushed through. And 
It's it's a it's a it's a technique that they've been using for a long time. It was used. It was actually uh, discovered by the Rand Corporation in the 1960s, and has been used in all sorts of businesses and and politics ever since. And basically, they're using it to bring in smart growth. And smart growth is all about uh, smart housing, smart streets, smart meters. Uh, they have visioning projects, um, public-private partnerships, sustain what they call sustainable communities, multi-use dwellings, you know, high-density urban units. This is all being pushed through at local level. What they ultimately want is, is everybody moved out from rural areas into stack and pack housing in smart cities um, because we are not able to, apparently according to the powers that be, we're not able to um, steward our own planet. We have to be controlled. Um, and it's got nothing to do with banks and corporations plundering the planet, it's us. And a lot of this is being normalised in, 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 in schools and in, in various, you know, UNESCO have done a brilliant job at normalising the whole global warming agenda in, in our schools and universities. And you'll find that sustainable development, which is what this is all about, it's all about control of the human population. Sustainable development is now being taught in many, many universities in England. And we've got a lot of people who actually are uh, being paid to, to churn this, 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 these belief systems out. And they believe it, and that's, I think that's our, one of our biggest uh, hurdles, is actually getting people to understand that everything that they've learnt um, may not be to the best interests of, of humanity. And that's a hard one for people that are actually committed to what they think they are doing for, to save the planet. And, and that brings me on a little bit to Rosa Coya, who is a, a woman who has been really talking about Agenda 21 in America for a long time now and she is an extraordinary woman and she's written this book called Behind the Green Mask because she believes that it, the, 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 green, the Green Party has been hijacked for this very reason that in fact Agenda 21 is being used by, is, 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 is using the Green Party to push through sustainable development because people think that oh yes that's that's all good you know sustainable development is not about recycling and saving the planet it is about control of humanity and you know i think there's a lot of well-meaning i'm not here to bash the greens i think there's a i used to be you know i I used to be a transition towner. I'm not, you know, I'm not averse to people doing wonderful things like growing their own food and, and, and all that stuff and, and seed sharing. I believe that's all very good and there's a lot of worthy people in the Green Party. But do, if you can, read this book, Behind the Green Mask, because it just shows you how uh, the, 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 the powers that be are controlling political parties. All, uh, all of them, absolutely all, all political parties. I just want to talk a bit about the Wildlands Project, which came out of the Global Diversity Assessment. And the Wildlands Project has been progressed very heavily in America. Um, and it is quite scary because they, they've got a map, they've published it. You can actually Google it, just Google the Wildlands Project America. And you will see a map of America and um, it's colour coded. Most of the map is red and that's where humans are not allowed. It's, uh, it's little or no human use. The next large amount of colour on that map is yellow, and they are buffer zones, and they're highly regulated use. That is really for military and government agencies, federal agencies. There's a very, very small amount of green dots, and that is where the humans live, and it's small amounts. Now, this, is, this has actually been published from this, to the Wildlands Project, and it is, it is really quite extraordinary that most of America is given over to the Wildlands, and it's a project to reinstate a wilderness, basically, in America. And there is an, there is a, there's, another, there's another one for England, and it's called um, Rewilding, the Rewilding Project we have in England. And they want to, in America, they want to restock most of America with wolves, bears, give it over to nature and this is all part of Agenda 21 because a lot of their funding goes to wildlife projects, the WWF are involved, um, the uh, RSPB, all these government bodies have, have uh, actually been produced, they're like quangos and they have been produced 
through Agenda 21. Uh, since 1993, they've been popping up all over the place, um, heavily funded by the UN to preserve wildlife. And this has been given as a reason for getting rid of human habitation. Um, and certainly in America, a lot, a lot of the, 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 you know, the, I don't know if anybody followed the Bundy Ranch um, uh, land grab in last April in uh, in Texas but that was pretty extraordinary where you know the, the the land was being taken over because it had been um designated as a a, 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 a as, as a place where wildlife needed to be so they were confiscating cattle and and taking the land off the people that owned it so i think that the wildlands project is really something to look at that what they want to do is put people in what they call human settlement zones, which is very concentrated urban dwellings on uh, railway tracks, high-speed railway tracks. They want to outlaw cars. Cars have to be got rid of because they're not sustainable. Um, there's a whole list of things that aren't sustainable. Uh, we aren't sustainable. Human beings aren't sustainable. You will not be allowed to walk in the countryside. That sounds crazy. That sounds amazing. You know, how can we be stopped from walking in the countryside? Uh, having a fish pond in your garden, growing your own organic vegetables and herbs. As we know, Codex Alimentarius is, is, has, has restricted a lot of what we can actually have, you know, to buy in a health food shop. There's, there's Monsanto. At the end of the day, Monsanto will be trying to control everything we eat. And with the TTIP, which is all part of Agenda 21, the Transatlantic Trade Agreements, this, this is all about control of our food. Our food is going to be controlled. Um, and it's, the, the, you know, the family unit's under, under threat, and our, most of all, our, our rights are under threat as human beings. You know, we, we, we are sovereign beings. We should not have to have people telling us how we live and where we live and, and, and to be controlled at this level. And it's interesting that um, the person who set up the UN in 1948 was a guy called Julian Huxley. He was the brother of Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. And Aldous Huxley knew what was going to happen to humanity. And Brave New World wasn't, wasn't a piece of fiction. It was just projecting the agenda forward a few years. I, I think there was a, a talk between Orwell and Huxley, and Orwell said, no, it's much worse than that, read my book. So they all knew each other, this lot. Julian Huxley really um, uh, has had, he, he put out the, the plan for all this. He was a eugenicist. He was part, a member of the Fabian Society. Um, the Fabians are always instrumental in all this. Now, this is, this is a plan since, since the 40s, you know, since before that, before, before all this kicked in. This is the, this is the result of, of, of all this thinking, this eugenic, eugenics sort of Fabian thinking and power over humanity. Uh, I just want to kind of reiterate, really, that everything that I've said is evidenced and um, things like the, the Wildlands Project of America can be found in, on page 993 of the Biodiversity Assessment. Uh, if you care to read it, mean, it's a massive great tome. I haven't read it all and I've certainly, re certainly read a lot of it. And it says here that basically um, the Wildlands Project is a long-term project where um, they intend to give over 30% of America to the wildlands. So people will not be able to live in America, apart from in the buffer, in, not in the buffer zones, in the human settlement zones. And most of it will be bus buffer zones, which should be as large as possible. Core areas that, that are corridors that should connect the, the human settlement zones. Um, so basically they, they, they you know the, the powers that be who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of our planet have plans for us to live in stack and pack housing in human settlement zones and give over the rest of the land to the wildlands and it sounds a little bit like the hunger games to me i don't know about you but that's what it feels like to me now 
who is who's involved in 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 building stack and pack housing in Britain? Well, there is there's a company called the Peel Group, a really really dodgy company. The uh, the CEO, the owner of the company and CEO, lives um, in Guernsey. He's a he's a tax exile, and they are building huge uh, developments that are 50 stories high and 50 miles long in on the banks of the River Mersey. There, there's another one in Liverpool called Liverpool Waters and Wirral Waters. But the Peel Group, they're a private real estate, media, transport and infrastructure investment company. Headquarters in Manchester, formerly known as Peel Holdings, they also are a fracking company. They're financed partly by Saudi Arabia, um, and they're owned by a reclusive billionaire in exile. His name's John Whitaker, and he lives on the Isle of Man. Um, they, there's, there's, they've got hundreds of subsidiaries all over the UK. Um, they're owned by his private family trust, uh, based in the Isle of Man. And he's the director of an astonishing 312 companies with interests in Liverpool, Doncaster... And mainly what I find really interesting about the Peel Group is that they actually own a lot of ports in England. Um, they own, and airports, they own Durham Airport, the Manchester Ship Canal, Scot all Scottish ports and docks, the docks along the um, banks of the River Mersey. They own uh, John Lennon Airport in Liverpool. Uh, they own the City Airport in London. Um, and apparently... Recently, they've made a bid uh, for uh, Bristol Airport. Now, um, these stack and pack housing uh, units are all on this new H2 railway line as well, which is a little bit scary because the, the figures don't add up for that either. Because it actually only gets you into into it from London. It gets you to Liverpool or Manchester uh, with only ten minutes um, uh, saving on the journey that the, the train takes you now. So what is the reason to spend billions on this H2 uh, railway line, this high-speed railway line, when there's, there's railway lines that, that go there anyway? Um, and if, if, if this is really what we're looking at, at stack and pack housing on major railway lines, then we need to really think about what that means. The Peel Group are... Uh, he's got a, they've got another big development called the Ocean Gateway. It takes 50 years to complete, develop 50 miles of bleak Dockland into a £50 billion development between Liverpool and Salford Docks, 50, 50 foot skyscrapers. And these, these are all smart, smart developments, which means they get gov government subsidy. The other thing I was going to talk about was really how Europe... I believe at the moment we were in, in this state at the stage that we were almost at in probably the 1930s where we've given up all our national sovereignty to a foreign power um, and, and that's been given away very freely by our politicians and, and you know I'm not a political person but I do see that Europe seems to be we, we, we as, a, as a country and, and other nation state, other sovereign nation states like Greece and Italy have not benefited from the, you know, the unification of Europe. And we're seeing you know, riots all over Greece and, and, and Italy and Spain because of the austerity that this, this unification has brought. Um, and I, I started looking into, into the history of, of, of Europe and what happened in, you know, in, in the last World War. And it's interesting that I found this piece of information that in 1944, um, there was a, a report written called the Red House Report. It was a meeting between high-ranking SS officers in 1944, just before the end of the war. Um, and it was held in the Red House, or the, it was called the Maison Rouge, in Strasbourg. And it was top SS um, officers uh, brought together all the major industrialists of, of Germany. Um, that was I.G. I. Farben and Krupps, um, uh, IBM, you know, I don't think they were called IBM, though. that's I.B. Farben, wasn't it? But Krupps and uh, BMW, all the major corporations, and basically said, look, we are losing the war, we can't win it mili militarily. 
uh, we will have to uh, win it another way. And the way we will win it is by actually getting the uh, financing the corporations to continue the war subversively. And they took the gold from uh, Switzerland that they'd um, raided from the, from, the, from the Jews, and they financed all the major corporations of Europe to do exactly what they're doing now. Um, and if you look at the blueprint of what Hitler had in plan for Europe, it's, it's actually exactly what it is now. Um, and I think we have to be very careful because this is, Agenda 21 is all part of it. And it's, 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 it's a global thing, it's not just Europe. What they're doing in Europe is they're trying to create the United States of Europe, get rid of all the cultures, all anything that, that actually is, is sovereign about those countries and turn it into the United States. And then from the United States, we've got the whole uh, takeover with Agenda 21. It will be a global takeover of all of us, of humanity. And that's really what I'm kind of banging on about right now. <laughs> anyway, um, there's one um, thing that I found that you know, that, that, that we here are trying to sort of get together, we're not trying, we are successfully getting it together, is, um, is a remedy for all of this. And I'd like to introduce my good friend, David Robinson, who has been looking at how really our Magna Carta, our, 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 our own natural laws, our own common laws are here to protect us and have been with us for, for, for years and years and years. Um, for centuries, and how the, the EU and the UN are hell-bent on destroying our rights with the Magna Carta, and how we need to protect the Magna Carta in order to beat what is happening to us. And we, we are at this point now where if we don't do something drastic, we will lose, if we don't use our Magna Carta, we will lose it. And, you know, the EU have gone and chipped away at our at our constitution with various treaty laws, the, the Maastricht, the Lisbon and the Nice Treaty have almost destroyed our Magna Carta, which it was put in place to actually stop us from being controlled by a despotic government or monarchy, uh, which is what's happened because our Queen has signed away her country to um, Europe, to, to, the, to the EU. And we are, at the moment, uh, in danger of losing all our unalienable rights. So I'd like to introduce David Robinson, really, to talk about um, practical lawful dissent or lawful rebellion and how we can use our Magna Carta, to um, Article 61 of the Magna Carta, to protect ourselves from the despotic governments and um, monarchies who seem to be um, chipping away at our constitution. Thank you. David. <laughs> well, thank you to Sandy for that, uh, delivering the, uh, the threat that's um, upon us, which is um, a credible and evidential threat. Um, and I'm here now to talk to you about a remedy that we've been practicing and I've been actually using for the past five years. Now, I'm only going to deal with evidential facts here. So it's all provable. All this, what we're saying is, don't just trust me and believe what I'm telling you. Look for yourself. Um, we've got a, a Facebook group page, Practical Lawful Dissent. Um, if you go in there and have a look in the files, you'll see all the evidence, all the, there's templates, there's all, all kinds of stuff that you need to know uh, about entering into lawful rebellion and actually using the process to, uh, to a successful end. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about lawful rebellion, one being the barons. The, the barons committee, who, who, uh, which, which was a quorum of 68 originally, um, broke up in, uh, set up 25 of their number to look at whether the uh, invocation of Article 61 was going to be necessary. So, in, this was in, in, in 1999, they... They, they set the quorum up and they discovered that the Nice Treaty was a treasonous, treasonous document and that they had an obligation under, under the common law, under constitutional law, to petition the monarch uh, not to give royal assent 
or got to ratify the Treaty of Nice. Now the barons have been vacant, they've been AWOL, then, since they invoked Article 61 for the people to use, they've gone AWOL. So the, the oath of allegiance that we write up and send to one of these barons is basically to prove with the document of our intention. So we're, we're standing under Article 61, Magna Carta 1215, pledging allegiance to the barons as long as they comply to constitutional law. And that's the, that's the big crux of it. They're in service to the people, it's not the other way around. They saw already, already served the people by invoking Article 61, which is evidential fact, as I said. You can check this out for yourself on the group page. We've got letters between the Barons Committee and uh, Sir Robin Jambren, who was the Private Secretary of the Office of Sovereign at the time. Um, we've also got Daily Telegraph reports of the invocation of Article 61, done by uh, Caroline Davis. On Daily Telegraph, on, written up on the 24th of March 2001, so you can Google that. You can see that it has actually been invoked, and it's not denied that it's been invoked. It can't be denied because it's all evidential fact. So we've entered into lawful rebellion by sending an oath of allegiance to one of the barons. Uh, there's a file in the group page of all their names and addresses, of current names and addresses of the barons. So um, we, we just do this to prove that we are not standing outside of the law. And in fact, we are the only group in this country who are standing under the law. Because if you read Article 61 of Magna Carta 1215, you will see that it's every sovereign man and woman's duty in the entire Commonwealth to support the barons in this process. Or you're basically aiding and abetting a treasonous regime. So hopefully, hopefully that will quash a couple of the misconceptions about the, the barons and Art, uh, Magna Carta. It wasn't a, con, uh, a contract that was signed under duress, as people are, are, are banding about. King, King John was a tyrant. He, he, he never had a sword at his throat to, to put his seal to the Magna Carta. He didn't actually want to do it. He, he walked away and later thought better of it because he was going to lose his, his place on the throne. So um, he was compelled just like you might compel a murderer to take the stand uh, in his defence, you know, someone who's, who's evidently committed murder. Under the same, that's the same kind of duress King John would have been in at that time. The treaty was sealed at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215. Um, this can't be, this, this can't be denied, it was, it was, it's, it's, it's done, it's, it's, it's written on parchment. And um, you know you can you can actually read it yourself. It was done in Latin, but it's been translated. You can see that our rights, in fact, our duty under the constitutional law, is to protect the constitution. And and once Article 61 has been invoked, then you have a duty. Everybody of this land has a duty to protect the laws that protect us. And that's another big misconception that people need to understand is we're standing under the laws that protect us. If you read Magna Carta, you'll see that we have the rights to trials by jury, we have the right of habeas corpus, we have our inalienable rights codified into a treaty so that they can't be denied by any dictators that may come along in the future. And that's what these treaties are about. They're about codifying our natural inalienable rights that can't be given nor taken away. So they're not like oh, I wasn't there, so I didn't sign the treaty, so it doesn't apply to me. Why wouldn't you want to protect your inalienable rights to justice? Because that's the trouble what we've got in this land today. And, uh, you know, Sandy's shown you the, uh, the, the points that prove that there's an imminent threat here. So why wouldn't we protect our, our system of justice that actually protects us from this criminality, these, these corporations that are trying to take over the planet? Well... We're doing it, and we're finding that we're having success with what we're doing, because we're standing by our guns, and all we're doing is evidencing facts to those that are making demands on us. We're proving that Article 61 has been invoked, and therefore they have a duty to stand under it, every individual does, and that we have a lawful excuse not to contract or to adhere to anyone making demands on us that are not standing under Article 61. 
That's the, the basic premise of what we're doing here. We send three, three notices. We start with a notice of conditional acceptance. So we, we will accept your summons or your, your fine or your demand for whatever it is on proof of claim that you have authority to issue that summons, demand or whatever since the Article 61 came into effect. What we're finding is that the courts are just ignoring us because they know. They know very well, well they're not courts of law, they're just private corporate entities deceiving everyone, you know, because you have to consent to these hearings, otherwise they have no authority over you. We're, we've got these private corporations tacitly agreeing to our, our documents by not responding to them. We send them reported, uh, recorded delivery, and once they're accepted by the Postal Service or someone signed for them, they've been accepted in law. So in our notices, we basically just ask that one question. Are you, have you the authority since Article 61 was brought into effect on the 23rd of March 2001? And, and like I said, so with the courts, they don't respond. And we, we carry on with the three pro processes of notices, which is the second one is the notice of default and opportunity to cure, to give them another chance to make good on the first notice, which they've acquiesced to. And the third notice is a notice of default, saying you're now in default, no, you, have, you agree there's no claims against me, kind of goodbye. And you can see that process done against Yeovil County Court by Danielle De Lioness on the Facebook group page. And it's a very simple process, and they ran away. They, you know, that was three months ago, she had 48 hours to present herself for a seven-day prison sentence after she just ignored the first two summonses, and this is over on water, water and sewage charges, which incidentally she's very much against paying because Margaret Thatcher stole the water companies in 1986. She privatised them, stealing a public service. We're using Article 61 to rebut the water, she's going after the council tax, and the sentence to seven days imprisonment has, has now gone away. And, and we'll keep you all posted on that process. We're, uh, We've now served them all with the fourth notice, which I haven't mentioned yet, which is the notice of misprision of treason. Now, what we do with this, with this notice is we evidence the treasonous matters by various individuals through the last 40 years, really. And uh, we, we, we put them on notice of the facts. Because under the 1795 Treason Act, Section 1, the, it, this is misprision of treason. Uh, anyone that in the realm that knowing of an act of treason being planned or committed in the country has an obligation under the law to report that crime to either the police or a justice of the peace. And whoever does not do that, but is in, not, in full knowledge of the facts, is committing a lesser crime of misprision of treason, which um, is total asset stripping if, caught, if um, convicted of this and life imprisonment. In Glastonbury, we've been actually practicing law for rebellion as a group for about the last year now. What we've done very briefly is we've lobbied the whole town, we've put flyers around the whole town, we've given information DVDs to different groups like the clergy, solicitors, um, we've went after the police and the council naturally, all with evidence facts of what's going on today and how they're trying to destroy or they're dismantling our country and they're doing it very insidiously and very, you know, it's just a ratchet rock by a ratchet affair. And they're completely dismantling our country now. And they have been since, well, since we entered into the common market. But especially now, they've stepped it up since the 1st of November last year. Uh, because on the 1st of November last year, the Neath Treaty came into effect in another 43 uh, areas of social authority or control. And even the police of Britain are now controlled by Europol under Eurogen 4, which is the EU police force, who incidentally have um, diplomatic immunity and guns. And uh, my appeal to everyone out there in YouTube land is don't take to the streets to do protests, because what we see is the government now really wants civil unrest. Okay? So they want you out on the streets to protest. They want to be seen as being very fascist these days because they want you to um, they want civil unrest and the reason for that is because they're depleting the depleting the police force in this country 
and we are, we are undermanned, the police are uh, aware that they are undermanned, and if civil unrest is kicked off um, by agent provocateurs, which is what is occurring, then we could have foreign troops on the streets of this country by stealth. It'll, you know, the, the people will accept it, we need these people in to say, help us, there's riots, whatever. We've got to prevent that, obviously, because if that happens, then we're under full uh, military occupation. We are, the, the, um, Britain is already under occupation, like I said, since, uh, especially since the 1st of November last year. In Glastonbury, we've lobbied the <coughs> police and the council <coughs> excuse me, for about a year now, but we've uh, we lobbied the, the, the local council for three months uh, when we were going to their meetings. We asked them one simple question. Where do you each stand on the invocation of Article 61? In September last year, we decided we'd had enough, and so as a demonstration only, we seized the, the town hall, where, where the public meetings were being held by the council. I told them that I was going to do it at, in the meeting, and they laughed. So we, we did it. We, we took it. It's all on video. Um, you can see it in the group files. Um, of, of what the police stated when they, they left us alone, they said, "Well, you're doing nothing wrong, you're not doing anything anything unlawful," and they left us with the building. We just did it as a demonstration. Anyway, so this is what we've been doing in Glastonbury. That's very briefly. What we're suggesting that we do th today is everybody should be lobbying the police. Now, we, we put it in a phrase of lobby the bobby, right, because that gives it the right kind of sentiment that we're talking about here. We're not going in with baseball bats. We're going in with evidence, facts of crimes being committed by government, local government and central government. And we're demanding that the police stand under their oath and observe the law. All we're asking them to do is to observe the truth. That's it. Now, if we were to do that en masse up and down the country, we're going to find that there are people within the police that aren't happy with what's going on today. And in fact, you'll find that in all services. And we will find, I call them the, the, the silent majority, and I think you'll find that they would uh, do the right thing. Many of them will. So we're not all on our own here. There's a lot of people in Lawful Rebellion. It's not just the Facebook group of 7,000. There's uh, Lawful Rebellion has been invoked for 14 years. There's a lot of people up and down the country. There's thousands and thousands of people in rebellion, and um, we, we're meaning business now. We, 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 we've had enough. All right, we've, we've got a Gen 21 coming down on us, like Sandy has said, TTIP, um, and we're not consenting anymore. And that we're finding that they're running away from us. As soon as we hit the treason matter, they don't want to know, because once we've evidenced these public servants, then uh, uh, of the treason matter, they come back at us. They're committing high treason at common law, and. and that is still a capital offence in this country. So they're a little bit concerned about doing that. Talk to you a little bit about outlawry. Well, we're not outlaws, as I said earlier. We're the only group in this country that are standing under the law. We're not uh, doing, we're not standing under any of the acts and statutes that were committed, that were, um, uh, came into to being after the, the 1911 Parliament Act. And that's because the 1911 Parliament Act was a treasonous act. Um, I don't want to go into that here right now, but you can you can look you can Google that. Asquith basically dis diluted the royal prerogative, which is an act of treason. And so since 1911, laws have been passed that haven't gone through the correct protocols of constitutional law, and we've therefore have laws that are fascist being uh, imposed and ratified or given royal assent by the, uh, the monarch, which incidentally is either usurped or you po uh, deposed, and that's not for us to judge, that would be for a trial or a jury to judge that. Um, that brings me on to Magna Carta again. Now Magna Carta uh, is an obligation by royal command. Now, it's, it is by royal command because this was put in place in case the monarch was usurped. So that gives the people remedy, and a peaceful remedy, if, we, if it's done correctly, against the usurpation of our sovereignty, basically. The Queen is in service to the people, 
She's supposed to be in service to the people. The people are sovereign. She uh, holds the sovereignty um, under the Coronation Oath Act, uh, where you can see, because it was televised, that she swore to uphold uh, God's law and the, uh, the, the constitutional laws and customs of this nation. So it is not us that are outlaws. It is the government who are in outlawry. And at this time, all police constables are operating outside of the law. And that's an evidenced fact. You can, you can just check it out. Right. They're planning on obfuscating the Magna Carta and creating a new Bill of Rights. Well, we, we've got to be mindful of this because we don't need um, a new Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights we've got protects us. It, it, it's just more um, codified natural law that uh, protects the people. And all, all we want in this movement is to evidence the treason matter, because that will get that out of Europe. Because once one act of treason has been proven to have been committed in a court of law, then all tr EU treaties will be null and void. And this is why they won't give me a properly convened court de jour trial, and I have sought remedy two years ago, and uh, when they dropped everything and ran away from me because I hit them with treason notices, and they were denying me that, that uh, inalienable right which I've got under Magna Carta as well. So uh, anyone that delay or denies my right to justice is committing treason. So they, they all back off. They don't want to put their names to treason. Well, we've just been through an election, and um, again, another rigged election. I mean, the, the evidence is just out there. I mean, what I don't know what people are like. We just go through the hamster wheel every four years. They rig an election. We kind of forget, and then we people start, um, you know, voting in four years' time. You know, let's let's stop doing this. It's it's crazy. Ever since we entered into the common market. All Prime Ministers in this country have been appointed. They've been appointed by the Bilderberg Group. Now, Sandy spoke a little bit about the Bilderberg Group. They are under the United Nations. They are part of the United Nations. The Bilderberg Group set up the EU, um, and this was all set up after the 1944 uh, meeting of generals in Berlin, and the uh, introduction of a, a document which you can see is a World Cup document, I can't remember the number of that, but it's called Europesh Wirtschaft Gemeinschaft. Now if you read, if you, you'd have to translate it, but if you were to read that, you'll see that it was brought into being, it, it, it's almost verbatim to the 1988 Maastricht Treaty, I think it was 88, sorry, if I'm wrong on that one. And so you can see that how they brought in um, Hitler's idea of Europe, um, in, into into being by the uh, treasonous treaties, and, and Maastricht was another treasonous treaty. So the election has been totally fixed. Um, we've got the the, 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 the the Tories back in, but it doesn't matter who would, who would be in because they're all following the party line, and we're finding this with every party. Um, the Law for Rebellion movement has lobbied UKIP and Susan Evans basically says that um, Magna Carta has been repealed. Evidently it hasn't been. And uh, the, just the general party line, you know, this is what I'm saying, it's, about, it's across the board. Uh, we went after the Green Party in uh, London uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Natalie Bennett did a talk at Brick Lane and uh, we attended this talk and uh, she just ran away from the question. I was first in there with... Uh, that the voting had dropped since 2001, and I asked whether that was because of the invocation of Article 61, and none of the panel would touch this, and we had a we had a um, a bit of fun there, but they they wouldn't touch it. They just I mean, Larry Bennett later on in the in the talk just ran out of the building as soon as a, 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 a colleague of ours mentioned the word treason. So they know, they know. So what do we suggest today? Well. What we're suggesting is not taking to the streets, right? What we're suggesting is to either send an oath of allegiance to one of the barons, or, if you're not comfortable doing that, declare your standing to either a, an alleged authority, like, like, like a chief inspector or, or, or a, a manager of a court or, or whatever, or a politician. 
You can declare your standing in Article 61. You can, you can put it in a, in a document, um, a notice of conditional acceptance, a, a notice of lawful ob objection. Um, I'll just explain quickly a notice of lawful objection, because if you've got nothing coming after you, you've got no claims against you, no demands are being made against you, and you really want to get off your arse and actually put Article 61 into effect, you can um, lobby the local police chief inspector, um, state your standing, provide a copy of your oath, and ask if there's any objection to your standing, because you don't want to come into conflict with the uh, policy enforcers. Uh, and you can get a little process going there. The premise behind using notices on public officials, alleged officials, are, uh, is to educate. That's formally what we're, what we're trying to do here, is to educate people en masse. So if we send notices to them, we're, we're being honourable, we're giving them a chance to remedy the matter, we're giving them a chance to um, understand Article 61. And uh, so, so if, if, if more of us are doing this, the word would be getting out there a lot quicker. And um, if, if they don't agree, or if they lie or ignore us, then we can go after them a bit further, as I said earlier, with um, notices of treason. And uh, that gets some, you know, gets some either backing off or, uh, um, or, or talking to you, we hope, in future. So far, they're just backing off. So, um, yeah, I mean, but that's the remedy. You know, they, they, they back off. They, you, they, they want you to go to court and you hit them with this stuff and, th and they back away. And the summons goes away. The prison sentence goes away. And uh, th that, that's evidence fact. You know, this is all I'm saying. We're, we're using this process and it works. We don't go to their courts because to do so, we're giving consent to their courts. Even by standing in there and saying, well, you've got no jurisdiction. We've actually given consent to it by walking in there. But there is another way of, and there's another way of thinking about that. Um, we can use their corporate hearings um, uh, if we go in as a claimant, but only if we're standing under Article 61, if we're in lawful rebellion, because we can do this under duress under duress of circumstances. And uh, we have a duty under the law to distress the regime in any way we can. And if they're, particularly if they're stealing something from you or something you have a right to defend yourself. But we never go in as the, the uh, defendant. We always rebut that. But going in as the claimant, well, we, we can... We can under that, those circumstances, you can use their rules against them even. So there are people out there doing this. I would personally suggest that anyone that goes into the magistrate's courts or the county courts is to do one thing, demand a properly convened court de jour to put the matter to be heard. They can't deny you it. If they deny you it, then that's treasonable. So um, if we want to get this treason matter... Um, heard in a court, we're going to have to go after, after these people for treason. I mean, if they didn't want you to know about paedophilia, for instance, it wouldn't be all over the damn news. They, they want you to look at this, look at this paedophilia, don't look at the treason matter. Because there's a remedy there for us if we look at the treason matter. And that's what they don't want. That's why they're trying to subvert the Constitution, that's why they're trying to bring in a, a new Bill of Rights. So you need to really start looking at what they don't want us to... You know, if, you, if voting did anything, they wouldn't let you do it. You know, so come on, guys. You know, this is this is this is a call to arms, a call to peace, <laughs> not arms. But um, if we don't work this out in a peaceful remedy, a peaceful manner, by using this process and standing together, we need to unite under the constitution to protect it. Um, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble, and we're running out of time. Well, I just want to talk a little bit about Article Sixty One. Um, the uh, we, we use it as to the letter of the law, so we, we actually look at the words and act according to the words. You know, so this is what, what we say when we when we say we we use the law as to the letter of it. We also look at the spirit of the law, why it was there, what it, it's intended for, um, and it is intended for when the monarch is usurped or the country is being invaded um, in a treasonous manner. We, you know, we've had a tyranny in this country before. So this has been set up because we've had these problems before. This is the great thing about the British Constitution. It's cre been created over longevity through um, times of turmoil. Anyway, back to Article 61. In this article, it basically puts it down the process of how to remedy the matter. And it, and it, it says that if 
um, we're not getting justice in our courts or uh, if tyranny is being allowed to reign, then a, a quorum of 25 barons are able to convene and to petition the monarch and uh, to get redress from whatever grievance that may be. 40 days are provided, and incidentally, the, the Office of Sovereign responded in 2001 on the 39th day with an unsatisfactory response. Um, but uh, that, that gives a process for um, remedy to be, to be made within a 40-day period so that the, uh, the grievance can be resolved, so that there's no it's civil war, basically. This is what it's about. It's about keeping the peace. So we can, we, we, um, Article 61, once it's been invoked, makes certain demands, and they are demands, because it's probably the most important common law tenet there is. Um, th 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 this is not like, you can't, there's no fence sitting with Article 61. You're either, in, you're either standing and defending the country, or you're tacitly agreeing to the tyranny. There's no, there's no fence sitting. So it, it stresses in there that we have the duty or the right to uh, seize castles, seize land, uh, distress and distrain the monarch in any way that we should see fit bar um, causing harm, physical harm to uh, the, be uh, the monarch's being or their heirs or successors. Um, so this, is a, this, is a, this charter is kind of, has equal consideration in it, this treaty. It says we'll, we'll provide you this remedy as long as you don't wage war against us and kill us. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a contract that uh, we need to uh, to to um, uphold. So, we're not talking about um, g going into Parliament building itself. That's you, that's going to we're going to come across a great deal of resistance if we do that. So, we're acting on a local level, and we're asking people to act on a local level as well to address the councils and the police in your area as to that one question, where do you stand under Article 61? It's a very simple process. Um, it gets them thinking, it gets them looking, and, and hopefully, well, it has to happen, that they'll, get, they'll come back on side of the people again when they realise that how they're being used. Um, once redress has been forthcoming, uh, we are supposed to uh, be loyal subjects, and I just want to explain that very briefly, um, to the monarch again. Okay? Now, we, I accept my position as a constitutional subject. Okay? I, I do that because our rights and privileges, not privileges, our rights and inalienable freedoms are uh, protected under the law. So under a constitutional monarch, my freedom, my right to justice is protected. So I don't mind my standing under the common law. I consent to common law. Do no harm. Cause no loss. Be honest and be peaceful. That's it. So anyone that doesn't want to stand under common law, really, I'm a bit suspicious of, because why wouldn't you want to do that? Well, to finish up, I'm just going to uh, promote the Practical Lawful Dissent Facebook group again. And um, we've got a, a great website, uh, lawfulrebellion.info. Um, so you can get all the information that you you require um, on those two places and uh, please come along and um, you'll get good um, responses from the admin.